Good morning. I too would like to welcome you to Current. My name is David. You know, speaking of these summer activity groups, I'm really looking forward to the softball team group uh, getting back in it. I was really happy. This is when you know you're getting old, when you look at the rules. A couple of us, uh, of us older guys were looking at the rules, and we saw that the rules you have to run past the base so there won't be any close play unless someone get hurt or pulling up like, all right, I can do this. I was like, man, I'm getting, getting too old for this. But if any, any of you guys are hidden softball athletes, uh, come join us. It'll be a lot of fun. I think it's Sunday afternoons. Um, today, uh, next Sunday is a big day in the life of the church. We're going to pick back up and do communion. It's been over a year since we've done communion together. Think about the effects of a global pandemic. Uh, to do that, the team's got these little individually wrapped you know, wafers and juices, so we, we're mindful of, of, of safety and health concerns and all of that. Uh, if, if you're joining us online and you've been at home over, uh, for reasons of habit, we'd love for you to join us next week for communion in person. There's nothing like being in the room for that. If you're at home for health concerns, uh, we encourage you, part of the reason why I'm sharing this now is so that you can pick up some bread and some juice and join with us uh, in, in that way. Um, but that should be, be a lot of fun uh, next week. Uh, let me pray, and then we'll get into today's uh, teaching. Father, thank you so much for uh, this time that we, can, we have together uh, to get into your word. We, we ask that you would please give us your spirit to understand uh, what you have before us and to be changed by it from, from the inside out. Uh, we ask this in your son's name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so well, as Cindy mentioned earlier today, we are talking about cultivating faithfulness. We are continuing our series Reset as we talk about cultivating character. We've been looking at this wonderful list of character traits in Galatians 5, this fruit of the Spirit as it's known in the Bible. Character traits like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Today we talk about cultivating faithfulness. Faithfulness is loyalty and courage. Faithfulness is remaining true over the long haul. And it seems to me that, that faithfulness is, is a really important character trait that maybe we don't tend to give it its importance. I mean, I think when it comes to love, hope, uh, excuse me, peace and, and joy, those are character traits. That, okay, we understand those are important. But faithfulness really underpins all of those, right? For, for what good are love, joy, peace, and, and the rest of those if we don't remain true to them? And then you flip that on its head. How, how amazing is, is it when we do remain true to things like love, joy, peace. So faithfulness is really, really important. It's remaining true over the long haul. And faithfulness was something this young pastor named Timothy really needed to be reminded of, really needed to be encouraged in. Uh, he and the apostle Paul had an incredible 15 years of ministry together, going around the Mediterranean, starting new churches, establishing leadership there, helping the needy and the poor, helping many people into the faith, helping many people grow in the faith, an incredible 15-year run of ministry. But by the time he was receiving this letter, he was clearly feeling down and out. I mean, just as you look at all the different references here, Timothy was feeling down and out. I can only imagine how it was when he received this letter. And he was probably see, feeling down and out for at, least, for at least two reasons. One, Christians were beginning to abandon the faith. In fact, uh, it, we're, we're told if you, if you look at chapter 1, verse 15, you'll see that Christians are leaving because of, of persecution. Bible scholars tell us that it's in all likelihood that Paul wrote this letter in the wake of the Roman emperor Nero instigating a fire in Rome, if you know, you know your history, and blaming it on the Christians. And then what happened as a result of that is just a lot of persecution to this new fledgling Christian church, and, and a lot of people were abandoning the faith. These people that Timothy had helped into the faith, starting to grow in the faith, they were leaving him, they were leaving Paul, and they were leaving the faith altogether. And what's more, Timothy must have been feeling down and out, because Paul was in prison for the second time, actually. Paul was in prison two times in Rome over the course of his life and ministry. The first time was more of a house arrest sort of situation. He wrote a lot of his letters to the church that we have in the Bible during that first stint in prison. But that was kind of a more house arrest, you know, more comfortable type of, of way of going about. He had a lot of, you know, just little freedoms that he could, he could take advantage of. People could find him, correspond with him, meet up with him. He had some freedoms there. And as far as, far as his outlook went, he felt at the time, that certainly things could have gone poorly for him, but probably they were going to work out okay. Well, this second imprisonment, 
as he's writing to Timothy here and now, was a lot different. Uh, he, he was looking at it. For, first of all, it wasn't like one of those house arrest sorts of situations. He was shackled to some dark, dank dungeon cellar with, prob- with, a, with a guard uh, neck also being shackled to him. And his outlook did not look good. In fact, he was basically writing in these letters, including the, the, the letter we're looking at right now, as if he's, he, w- he would be executed. And in fact, most Bible scholars think that it was probably within a few days, perhaps a few weeks, of writing this letter to Timothy that he was executed. Which means, given the travel that would have happened to deliver this letter, Paul, Paul had probably already passed away and been executed by the time Timothy was reading this letter. Being down and out. I mean, you, you taking this all in, how Timothy must have felt as he was received, as the outlook on life, what he was facing, and just and the, the tone of this letter reflects all of that. One Bible scholar I was reading this week said, if you really place yourself in the shoes of Timothy here, just take it all in, what he's facing and, and how Paul's communicating to him as like a fatherly figure to him, you can't help but read this and get misty-eyed. I mean, it's an incredibly moving affectionate letter, and it's a letter that is a call to faithfulness. And here in the beginning of chapter 2, we see this especially. Paul is reminding Timothy to remain true. He's, he's, He's reminding him of some wonderful truths and promises to help sustain him. And I think that's really key as we get into this text, that Paul is reminding Timothy it's like the great sage of our time, Mr. Samuel L. Jackson said, uh, we need to be reminded more often than we need to be instructed. Paul is reminding Timothy, this pastor of 15 plus years, of these truths to help him be sustained, to help him be faithful, to help him cultivate faithfulness. So we're going to look at how we too can full- cultivate faithfulness. Let's look at verse 3 as we, as we jump in here. Paul wrote, join with me, Timothy, in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So here's the first thought. Like the soldier, we need to realize we're at war. Join with me like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. We need to realize we're at war. Uh, The way the Bible thinks of it is the minute you decide to put your faith in Jesus, the minute you decide to commit your life to him, is the minute you join a battle. You go to the front lines. And it's also the minute that you choose a very scary enemy. Now, I don't have a lot of time to kind of give this a thorough treatment, but let me just say this. Uh, while a lot of people in our culture and our society have uh, you know, uh, a challenging uh, a notion with this idea of a spiritual reality, spiritual warfare, this idea of, of Satan, there are actually more and more secular uh, scholars who are saying the Western mindset, the Western way of thinking is actually inadequate in terms of understanding all the realities of the world as we go about it. So, for instance, if all we can do is observe and make sense of the world through the material or through the physiological, we are ill-prepared to deal with everything. So, for instance, there was a a secular scholar and liberal professor out of Columbia, a guy named Andrew Del Banco, who wrote a book called The Death of Satan, How Americans Have Lost the Sense of Evil. And he was asked in an interview, hey, you call yourself a secular liberal. Why are you writing a, a, a book like this? And without skipping a beat, he said, because of the Holocaust and other things of that nature. And uh, this, you know, Del Banco is um, a grandson of Eastern European Jews, and he actually had some ancestor, uh, an- relatives excuse me, who were, were killed during the Holocaust. But he went on to say, if you get rid of the idea of a transcendent evil, say that evil is only the result of human mistakes or problems, then we have a problem. If we say the Nazis just had physiological problems, that trivializes it. And accepting it's just evolutionary survival of the fittest gives us no foundation to say it's wrong, which it was. It was evil, end quote. And for many who don't have a challenging uh, concept of, uh, you know, don't find it hard to believe that there's this spiritual reality, there's this spiritual force out there. It seems to me that a lot of times when you think of like a devil, you think of like the cartoon red, you know, pitchfork figure that's on the shoulder just saying, hey, you know, I'm trying to tempt you to do this external thing and that external thing. But the Bible teaches us that it's far more subtle than that. In fact, C.S. Lewis in his book, Screwtape Letters, really kind of picks up on this and talks about how it could be something as innocuous as, a, as, as the temptation of just throwing in the towel and giving up. Or something as innocuous as giving into something more and more that in and of itself is not necessarily bad, but takes our eyes off what really matters. Look at how Paul goes on to talk about this in verse 4. He says, No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. 
but rather tries to please his commanding officer. I have a good friend and pastor, mentor type figure who said he thinks the greatest tactic of the evil one when it comes to this sort of thing is not so much like the overt temptations of drugs or, or getting into an affair, which the enemy will, will do and do, does use, but it's more, the, the greatest tactic he said in his mind is probably more to get the Christian just to settle. To get the Christian just to settle with a comfortable life, with niceties and, and luxuries, or maybe just being only about career to the point of, missing out on what really matters of, of, of eternal worth. Paul says to Timothy, who, who's feeling down and out here in verse 3, join with me in suffering like a good soldier in Christ. You know what's amazing about good soldiers? A lot of things. But um, if you read military uh, history or just talk to a veteran, it's pretty incredible. Uh, good soldiers, when they are in battle and bullets are whizzing over their heads, explosions are going off all around, a good troop of soldiers will... Without, it's not to say they're not scared or they're not, their hearts aren't racing, but they'll just stick to, they'll just keep at the mission. They'll just keep at the task at hand. In other words, they're not thrown by the fact that they're in a war. And it seems to me that a lot of Christians aren't living in light of what Paul is saying to Timothy we need to live in light of, and that is we're at war. So Christian friends, do you recognize that you're, you're at war? Uh, Cindy and I feel like it's uncanny that every time we go to do a big initiative here at the church, uh, it just feels like this concept of spiritual warfare is just front and center. It just seems like a lot of leaders just happen to, the weeks leading up to it, happen to have a spike of just like trouble or working through different things. And by the way, it's not necessarily related to the church ministry. It could just be in their workplace or whatever it might be. Or leading up to a big event, it just seems like marriages get like a spike of, of hardship. Or, or whatever the case might be. It's, it's, it's uncanny to the point that Cindy and I will just look at each other and go, oh yeah, it might be because that big event's coming up, followed by the thought, and we got to pray. But I don't think, we, you could definitely overdo this thing and over, you know, generalize. Everything is just, oh, this spiritual warfare thing. But I think for, for most of us, for our cloth of, of faith, we can underestimate it and not recognize that we're at war. And we need to recognize that we're at war. If we are at war, let me ask, are you bunkering down? You know, are, are, you, are you living in light of that? So just to get us thinking about this, I don't know what this might mean for, for you, but just for the sake of generating thoughts for, for you, are you bunkering down in your marriages? Because when things get hard, are you, are you recognizing that relationships are probably going to be attacked? And are you able to, when you see that perhaps that there's a spiritual element to this, all the more extend grace and benefit of the doubt instead of letting it harden your heart, which we can so easily do, myself included. Are you bunkering down, fleeing certain apparent temptations in your life? If we're at war, where might you be, quote, entangled in civilian affairs? Again, I don't know where this might mean for you, but just to give some ideas to generate thoughts for you. Are, are you entangled in civilian affairs when it comes to finances? Here's a thought that came to me this week. Like, are you living with a, a, a wartime budget mindset? I mean, we, as a society here in the Silicon Valley, have a lot of resources, generally speaking, at our disposal, and there's a lot of needs in the world. Are you, are you living, stewarding it as if it's God's, God's uh, resources that he, he calls you to steward, making decisions in light of that? Uh, are you entangled in the civilian affairs of your career? Now, I want to be clear, we're not talking about ambition and career being a bad thing. No, 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 no. But if it becomes the only thing, and it... It takes precedent over relationships, over community, over worship, and a number of things that are of eternal value, then it, the enemy might be happy about that. <laughs> and for those of you guys really feeling it, say in your relationships, whatever the case might be with a roommate, in the workplace, in your marriage, can you endure it like a good soldier? Can you, can you recognize that there, that might be going on and take strength, take heart in light of that. So first thought is like the soldier, we need to realize we're at war. Second thought, like the athlete, we need to compete with discipline. Verse five says this, similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does, uh, uh, excuse me, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Our little nine-year-old has really gotten into uh, baseball this last season 
and uh, he takes after his mommy and daddy, especially his kids, and just doesn't have a lot of muscle on his bones, just like a stick. And so he's been doing all these exercises to try to get stronger and throw the ball faster and hit the ball harder and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's really good, even just for the exercise of it. But he'll do lunges and push-ups and all that sort of thing. Well, after one of those like exercise bouts uh, this week, he said, Daddy, you know, just, he was out of breath. He's like, man, I really wish there was a pill you could take just to become instantly strong. And I don't know why I decided to open up this can of words and head down this route. I was like, well, it's called steroids. And now I'm like talking to a nine-year-old like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I got to explain all this stuff. And I'm like, you don't want to do that though. First of all, because it's illegal. It's bad for your health. And really it's cheating, that sort of thing. And I said, it's just like Barry Bonds and how, you know, he hit all these home runs, but really he did it like, and I love Barry Bonds. I'm a Giants fan, but he did it by cheating and all that sort of thing. He's like, Barry Bonds took steroids? And I'm like, oh, here comes longer (laughs) discussion. I got to explain all this. So I'm like, yeah. And you know, the thing with Barry Bonds, it's interesting. He hit, I mean, you know, for those baseball fans, non-baseball fans out there, he hit like so many home runs, just shattered the records. Um, And uh, he will always be remembered, not first and foremost for those home runs, but for having taken steroids. In other words, again, I say this with respect, but like, you know, by, by cheating, by bending, by, by bending the rules for himself. And it's especially tragic in Barry Bond's case because if you know his story, and of course we have to kind of take his word of mouth, and, but you look at the before and after pictures, it seems pretty clear that he started taking steroids a few years into his professional career. So there's, that transformation happened kind of after a few years of playing. And in his early years, he was actually part of what's known as the 40-40 club. So he hit 40 home runs and, four, and had 40 stolen bases in one year, meaning he hit hard and ran fast. It's like he was an incredible athlete. And then he took these steroids. Again, we don't know the timing, but it's like, it's like oh, man, he would, have been, he would have been amazing, and there would have never been this asterisk of a thought next, next to his name. But you contrast Barry Bonds and what he'll be known for and kind of like how that played out with the other athlete of the classic athlete is Eric Liddell. You guys recognize that name? The movie Chariots of Fire. If you haven't seen Chariots of Fire, you need to see Chariots of Fire. It's made in the early 80s, I think. I think it, it holds up. It's pretty, you know, timeless in that regard. But Chariots of Fire is a, is a tr- uh, depicts this true story of an Olympic runner who went to, you know, compete, but decided to only compete, you know, use top of his, you know, class, only to compete and win if he could do it with honor, if he could win with honor. And a big part of the movie is even denying himself to compete if he could not win with honor. And I think, I think that is, in a way, what, what Paul is talking about here when he says we're, we're to compete according to the, to the rules. We're, we're to compete according to the God's rules or, rules, or to break the metaphor. We're, we're, we're to live according to God's ways. The Christian is called to deny themselves, to say no to certain things, to do the things that God calls us to, and not to do the certain things that God doesn't call to us. Now, quick sidebar of a thought here, theologically speaking. Paul is not talking about salvation and how we you know, have to earn our way into salvation here, that you need to compete and live and do the things God calls you to do and don't do the things God calls you not to do so that you can have a relationship with him, so that you can be saved and be restored with him. That's not what Paul's talking about. How do we know that? Because everywhere, including this letter, Paul over and over again says the only way to be saved is to receive what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, period. It's a gift. We receive it. So what, Paul is, what is Paul saying here is he says we've got to compete according to the rules or live according to the way God calls us to. He's saying to the degree that we do that, God is going to honor that in this life and there will be a reward in the next. He is going to honor it. For crying out loud, that's good in and of itself. The Lord himself will honor it. I think that's the highest goal, the highest aim, the highest reward in itself. But there's even more a part of that. And so we live according to his ways when it comes to finances, when it comes to sex, when it comes to relationship dynamics. We talked about it last week, when it comes to loving our enemies, even turning the cheek. And you know, one of the most incredible rules, if we use the metaphor of of God's way of living, is receiving grace. Because the reality is, you and I are going to stumble as athletes, or we're going to stumble in life and not do the things he calls us to, any number of times, repeatedly, regularly. And when you do, there is grace to be received. That's part of competing by God's rule. It's, it's just living from his grace, receiving that. Turning from things that we need to turn from, but just living from his forgiveness, which he offers so freely. So like the athlete, we need to compete with discipline. Like the soldier, we need to recognize we're at war. Like the farmer, we need to work hard toward the harvest. 
been using a lot of the farmer examples in the series. Like I said at the very beginning, Paul likes to go there. But verse 6 says, The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Now, really, the emphasis here, grammatically speaking, in, in the original language, is this word hardworking. And what he's saying is, is being a Christian is not just floating through life with God working for you, but putting our hands to the plow and working to serve the Lord, enjoying the privilege of getting to be his servant faithfully as we live our life. Put another way, if we put our faith in Jesus with the attitude, okay, I'm doing this provided God is going to like work for me, he's going to provide for me, he's going to take care of me in the ways I want and, and, and in the timing I want, then things are fine, then, then I'll stick at it. If we approach things that way, Paul is saying that, that that's what Paul's warning against here. And I think what's different about the farmer, especially in respect to the soldier and, and the athlete, is that theirs is not a glamorous life, right? I mean, the soldier, and especially, of course, the accolade uh, athlete, they're going to receive praise. They're going to receive acknowledgement. The, but the farmer just gets at it morning after morning, plowing, you know, seeding all the rest of it. And this is a powerful statement when he says they should be the first to receive a share of the crops. That's incredible. That's to say that the farmer doesn't just work for the sake of the work. They get to enjoy in the fruit of their labors, both here and now and in the next life is, is the thought here. You know, as I was preparing this message, it made me think of our operations team. I think of the, the team that gets up early on Sunday mornings to set all of this up, set the kids' rooms up, of course, you know, this is a portable setup, tear down operation. Normally, this is not looking like this. This is a hotel banquet room. Of course, we all know that. The, the operations team comes in and, like, does their thing and then takes down afterwards. And every chance I get, I hope, I hope you, you will join me in this, when they're doing their thing, I'm always like, man, thank you guys so much. Because, man, if not for that team, those teams, we would not be seeing the wonderful work that God has been doing in and through the life of this church or, for that matter, into the future as long as the Lord has us together on, on this mission in this place. And you just think about the dozens and dozens and dozens of people who've put their faith in Jesus. And the many people who've come back to the faith. And the many people who've been healed relationally and all these different things. Operations team has been a big part of what you, you doing your thing. And you know, I was thinking about this, like you share in the, the fruits of the, uh, of, the, of the crop, of the harvest. And when, when I was a little guy, I, got, I was on... I was on the operations team. We didn't call it that. We weren't very well organized back then. And we definitely didn't have these nice, big, easy-to-roll cases going around everywhere. We were like these weird, every box was different. And, we, you know, we had to play Tetris to fit, you know, fit it into the storage uh, compartment and all of that. But I wouldn't change it, trade it for the world. Uh, first of all, because I, it was just a blast hanging out with the other guys that we were just getting to do that with. But more importantly, I feel like it just gave, I wouldn't trade it for the world because it gave me a front row seat to see God working in that church. I would not want that to be taken away. I sh I, I'm so glad I got to be a part of that, both in the here and then, and then, and then even as Paul's talking about for, for, for the rest of it. So as we think about this in terms of application, what, what might this look like for you to get after the Lord's work like a hardworking farmer? Could it mean signing up and serving on a team? Got to take advantage of that thought. Um, if, if you are interested, we'd, we'd, we'd sure love to talk to you. You can talk to the welcome team over there in the front or find uh, someone on staff. They'll help you find a spot. Could it mean getting into God's word more faithfully, regularly, on, on a daily basis so that God's word, his teaching is, is in your heart, motivating you, with you as you make decisions about your day? Could it mean investing and continuing to invest in relationships in the workplace, in your neighborhood, so that by prayer and and, and the hope really being they get to experience the love of Christ through you. So like the soldier, we need to recognize we're at war. Like the athlete, we need to compete with discipline. Like the farmer, we need to work hard toward the harvest. And what we notice about each and every one of these occupations is they all need faithfulness. They all need to keep at it over the long haul because the soldier who stops fighting before the battle is finished will never get to experience victory. And the athlete who stops running the race before it's done, we'll never get to see the race won. And the farmer who stops working, of course, uh, before the harvest is, is complete, we'll never get to taste the fruit of that crop. But here's the main thought that Paul is saying. As he gives these metaphors, analogies, he couches it all with this thought to help us understand that, yeah, we need to commit to these things, but underneath it all, we need to understand that we need help, and God makes that available to us through Jesus. 
Because look at verses 1 and 8 as they kind of couch, as they kind of bookend these, these thoughts. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is Christ Jesus. Verse 8, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. It is really striking to me that Paul here was writing a pastor of 15 years, remember Jesus. Right? You would think that Timothy had probably been teaching and preaching Jesus. In fact, we know he was, okay? I mean, there's places in the scripture, we know he was doing that. So then why was Paul saying, remember Jesus? Why was he saying, you got you to do this? He was saying, when you're in the fight like a soldier, when you're competing like an athlete, when you're hard at work like the farmer in the fields, are you remembering Jesus? Timothy, don't just go to church. Timothy, don't just preach a sermon. Timothy, don't even just read your Bible without remembering the person and work of Jesus. Remember Jesus, who he is and what he's done for you. Specifically, he says, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Remember, Timothy, that the battle is won. The war is won. There's battles raging, but the war is won. Jesus has defeated once and for all sin and death. And by the way, the evil one too. He's got this. He's got you. Remember him. By the way, Timothy, talk to the people who are witnesses. You can go talk to them if you need to. But remember, Jesus Christ raised from the dead. And then, number two, he says, remember Jesus Christ descended from David. I think he's saying there, remember, Timothy, that God had this planned all along. A thousand years ago, Timothy, 3,000 to us, God was talking about this. He was prophesying this. He was saying it was all going to work out. God is sovereign, in other words. He's in control. He's going to take care of you. Remember Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 9, I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal, Paul went on to say, but God's word will not be chained. Remember Jesus, the head of his church. He's in control. He's got it in his hands. Remember Jesus, the husband of his bride. That's a great analogy in this instance because like the true and good husband to us, all his followers, his bride, Jesus remained and remains faithful. In fact, that's where Paul ends this whole thought, as we'll read here in a second, that even when we're faithless, he remains faithful. But his thought here, as we close, is as you do this, as you remember the person and work of Jesus, and commit to him as, as best you can, like the good soldier, like the, like the athlete, like the hardworking farmer, to the degree you remember Jesus and all this, you'll be able to remain faithful. Remain true. You'll be able to endure, even, by the way, for Quote, the elect, verse 10 tells us, that helping more obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And that's an incredible thought. Paul's saying, Timothy, to the extent you remain, you will not just be able to kind of remain strong, but the work through you will be carried out and it will be incredible. And obviously, historically, uh, many of us are here today because of God's work through Timothy remaining. Oh, Timothy, oh, Timothy's here at current this morning, remain faithful to his call, to his mission. Let's, let's end with these wonderful words. Here, words. Here's a trustworthy saying. Paul concludes, if we died with him, that is Christ Jesus, we also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown, disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Let's pray. Father, what a promise that even when we are faithless, you are faithful. And the fact of the matter is we are faithless far more often than we care to admit or even recognize. And yet you are faithful. And so we say thank you. When we stumble, when we fall, we can, we can ask you for forgiveness and we can, we can turn back to you and you, you will give us your spirit to help us in all that. Father, would you help us endure in all this? Would you help us remain faithful, learning from the soldier, learning from the athlete, learning from the farmer? But most of all, would you help us remember Jesus? Even like the, the pastor who had been at it for 15 years, spending a good chunk of that time with the apostle Paul, needed to be reminded, remember Jesus. Would you help us remember Jesus? Would you help us remain strong in the grace that is Christ Jesus? I pray this for those especially feeling. I pray that for all of us. In the name of Jesus, who was raised from the dead, descended from David.